Are these upcoming projects on the wall? Yeah, those are. Please don't share. I'm not sharing anything. <laughs> I'm taking I'm taking it all in. Now, every time I come in here, there's always something new to discover. It's like, you know, when you go into a stranger's attic, that's what it feels like. Like, I, you like you're exposing yourself to me a little bit every yeah. time I come in here. I tend to get the sensation that like, that's why you're offering to watch the kids today is so you can Rummage come in your here shit. where we're gone and figure out why is that wig over there? Mm -hmm. I'm going to take pictures in it and then send it to you guys while you're out. He's figured out my plan. Welcome back to Rated Radio with your hosts, Rayburn Alexander and Shane Windham. Shane, what Billboard hit did we cover this week? The song is called Mommy, right? M-A-M-I-I-I. -I -I. Sure. Mommy. All caps. Yeah. By Becky G and Carol G. What'd you think about it? God, shoot me in the face, man. What is it? <laughs> What are these names? And this? I'm so out of it. Mm-hmm. I agree, but continue. It's been a fun week, by the way. Every time I open social media, all I'm seeing are the animated moms that people would smash. Oh, yeah, like the Lois Griffins, the the chick from, what is it, like Billy and Mandy? Not there, Billy and Mandy. Anyway. Continue. There's a lot of them. There's way more than I expected, and apparently somebody out there wants to fuck every last one of them. Mm -hmm. By the way, in case you're confused, yes, that's that's what it is. For all you old folks out there, it's cartoon characters that people would fuck in real life if they could i love seeing those which cartoon character started your sexual awakening mm -hmm. those are always interesting apparently simba from the lion king is a big one i remember seeing something about how it's supposed to be an indicator of uh sexual predators especially child sexual predators if, if, if they watch like that cartoon porn shit or have those tendencies to okay I can see being, you know, a, a finding a shape appealing, even if it's a drawn cartoon character. And okay, well, let let's let's lay it all out. Let me let me ask you this question, Jessica Rabbit. Where do you fall see, in the boner category? That is the first thing I remember as a kid. Yeah, was that's Jessica Rabbit. That's what a lot of people do. And she's mixed in with real people. So I came up thinking that that was the norm. You you've got that. You've got Cool World. Yes. With Brad Pitt. Mm -hmm. you know, it, That's a good movie. Oh, Jessica Rabbit was the bomb. Okay. So does that make you a predator? <laughs> I don't actually think that I want to have sex with that cartoon character. I'm trying to think. There is there is a drawn... I think it's the uh, the girl from Croods, like the daughter in the oh, Croods movie. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I find her shape very appealing. Okay. Anyway, you can tell how interested <laughs> I am in this song. <laughs> Uh, Mommy by Becky G and Carol G. And I apologize to listeners. We will be talking about Natalie Merchant and Jewel yes. momentarily. Most people will want to know up front that this entire song is in Spanish. And you know me. I have no issues with that. What struck me here was just how much I liked the instrumental. It's not groundbreaking or even all that interesting, but it does sound nice. And the vocal flow of the track is nice too, but I'm not crazy about the actual sound of the vocals. They're over-processed and use too many effects. We're talking auto-tune, echo, reverb, along with the dual vocal chorus effect you naturally get from layering the vocals. And the voices just aren't my bag, striking me as a little too whiny. I'd still go with a four here though, it's not bad. Could live without it though. For me, for the most part, this is perfect for sitting poolside in the dead of summer or traveling to places with cooler waters to escape this harsh, harsh Texas heat. Uh, this track gets you dancing and stays true to the Spanish inspired sounds of today, which are very much popular. I gave it three. Okay. A three, I guess. I was worried it sounded like a five. Like, no. Are you really going to use Texas? No. <laughs> no, I, I couldn't give it a five. I, I don't like to. In the past, I've harshed on songs in different languages because oh, I can't understand them. Uh, but it was nice. It had a good beat. It had a nice vibe to it, even though that I couldn't understand word for word. Right. If it's on somewhere, you're yeah. not going to be mad at it. Yeah, so just... I gave it a three. It fell in the middle for me. All right. That's mommy. <laughs> How the fuck did we get on cartoon characters? I will not know. Like, I don't even know where that came from. We'll have to listen back <laughs> to see. Roll the intro. driving this very emotional femtastic disco big rig 
<laughs> you drive whatever you want to. All right. Apparently, I'm in the vehicle. I could live without knowing what it's called. I kind of cringe inside every time you say it. With the disco big rig? <laughs> yeah. Get over it. So the first artist that we covered was Natalie Merchant, Miss Natalie Merchant. And her first album is Tiger Lily from 1995. This was my top album. Agreed. I gave it three fives out of 11 tracks. Eight. My top track was I May Know the Word. Okay. I'm surprised. Mm, I'm full of surprises. I was torn between three and none of them were your top track. Okay. But uh, Beloved Wife was one of them. I'm going to explain each one of these. I'm sorry. You go right ahead. This is your moment. Beloved Wife always... Since I first heard the album a long, long time ago, way before I was ever in a relationship or anything, I always kind of knew, like, I don't want to outlive my partner. Yeah. Because <laughs> I'm going to hear this song and just Fall apart. end it. You know, yeah. like, yeah, it's just as bad. Uh, River, I've always loved. And the historicity behind that with uh, River Phoenix, mm -hmm. you know, Joaquin's Brother, sibling. That, yeah. yeah. Died outside of the Viper Room. Mm -hmm. Good overdose. Yeah, and they were all close. Oh, I didn't know Natalie was close. I didn't yeah, know that she that was song friend was of the family. Her. Okay, a song about him. And then seven years uh, that came later in life. I liked the song when I was young, but there wound up being some genuine like I can tie every word of this song to my life now. Yeah, and that's brutal. Anyway, it, good top tracks. Whatever. Moving on. My bottom track was "Where I Go." Jealousy. Okay. For me, this is sensual and sad. This was more produced than Jewel's debut track, uh, which we will get to a little bit later. Can be repetitive, but Merchant's voice still remains overall very, very pleasant. And you're not going to agree with this comparison, but to me, Natalie Merchant on this album is the female Chris Isaac. Fight me. I don't have any problem with that. Okay. Because I don't know why she just... It felt that way. Very to me. soulful. Mm -hmm. You know, it strikes you on a deeper level. Mm -hmm. You don't really see it coming. Mm -hmm. Anyway. Definitely didn't. I hadn't heard any Nat well, one, maybe one Natalie Merchant song. Right. Yeah. The you didn't one. Didn't know much. Mm -mm. Okay. Uh, the unapologetic charm and poeticism of this easy listening gem is masterful to the point of feeling like home at any age. A slow motion stream of the nostalgic way we look at parts of our lives in that mental rear view. It's got some bits that barely miss my mark, but knowing Rolling Stone gave the album 1.5 out of 5 stars is all that needs said in favor of your going and hearing it immediately. Are you shitting me? No. What do they give Nirvana's Nevermind? I really, really am curious to know. Because to me... It was probably high. Okay. This is good. I liked this album by Natalie Merchant. I could just turn it on and let it play. Yeah. Uh, in case we haven't said it before, uh, Natalie Merchant falls into the alternative rock, pop, Americana, and folk category, mm -hmm. depending on where you listen to her and her discography. I just wanted to say that up front because some people might not know where she falls no. because she's kind of fallen off in recent years. She's still alive. She's still alive. Yeah, oh yeah. Okay, just making sure. Uh, she's fallen off in recent years, and for those that aren't, affili aren't affiliated, aren't familiar with her, I just wanted to put that up front early in the episode. So. She was also the uh, lead singer for 10,000 Maniacs. Damn it, you took one of my- Those of you who... Trivia pieces away. Oh, my bad. <laughs> it's okay. Do you know anything from 1,000 Maniacs? 10,000? 10,000, that's what I meant. No, I don't. I tried listening to some of it once when I was younger. It didn't vibe with me. Whatever I picked up and was listening to, I still plan to go back and hear it at some point because clearly I love Natalie Merchant, mm -hmm. so I've been a fan for a very long time. I'm actually really excited about this episode. I'm not showing it well because it's 10 o'clock in the morning on a mm -hmm. Saturday, but, well, and I don't have caffeine like the rest of you. Yeah, can't really have it. But you do have your electrolyte water. Get lit. Totally. <laughs> Speaking of loving Natalie Merchant, let's move on to her next album. The next album that we covered by her was Oph Ophelia from 1998. This was my middle album. Agreed. I gave it two fives out of 12 tracks. I gave it nine. My top track was My Skin. Completely agreed. Nice. Yes. And my bottom track was Effigy. See, I like Effigy. It is, it's way too repetitive. Mm -hmm. I get it. You know, it doesn't really move anywhere. But if, if you're if you're vibing with it, like it, it, it goes hard. Yeah. Uh, mine was when they ring them golden bells. I still like the song, to be clear. It's just, it's not exactly my style. Okay. Which 
trying to remember if, if that was like the, not bohemian, but like the Indian style one. Anyway. It's been too long. Okay. <laughs> so you remember how the last episode was sensual and sad? Well, this is angrier and sad. Uh, sounds a little more like Dido here, or Ditto, however you pronounce her name. Uh, the 60s synth piano was detected, as well as a little bit of slide guitar, so adding a little bit more elements to her music with this album. And to me, Merchant was in a much darker place here, and you can sense a little bit of resentment, and that's all I have to say about that. Well, though I find parts of this spin more moving than the previous album and other parts more hokey, uh, this still feels like a continuation of what was great about the Tiger Lily album. There's less guitar soloing and a heavier emphasis on symphonic elements. Otherwise, these discs are very much sisters. I'd add that hearing the song Ophelia after the recent overturning of Roe vs. Wade by our joke of a Supreme Court was an even greater comfort than usual. Don't get me fucking started, okay? Ah, uh, let's just move right along then. All right. Next album that we covered by Natalie Merchant was the self-titled album, Natalie Merchant from 2014. This was my bottom album. Agreed. I gave it one five out of 11 tracks. I gave six. My top track was The End. Seven Deadly Sins. And my bottom track was Lulu. Yeah, the introduction. Yeah. Mm -hmm. This is more folk and Southern at times. The voice has changed, which gradually comes with what, uh, at least a, almost a 10 year time jump, uh, but still remains soulful. It seems a little bit more religious here, though I don't consider Natalie Merchant a very religious person, but I could be wrong. Um, but she can definitely get sillier at times. I think that she touched a little bit on the silliness with Ophelia. And just kind of expanded on it a little bit with this album. I'm pretty sure that between the last album and this album, she had either one or two more solo discs. Mm -hmm. And then I want to say prior to this, she did the two disc poetry albums where she just read classic poems. Mm -hmm. She like made songs out of them. Okay. They're trying to, to bring classic poetry back into the forefront of modern civilization, which were great. I just didn't want to cover a, a double album Yeah. at this point. Tired. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> we have specials for that, people. But yeah, there, there's, there's a noticeable difference in her writing and styles, mm -hmm. uh, but you do still. It, it's very much Natalie Merchant. Mm -hmm. Gone are the days of Merchant's easy listening style having alternative flair. Uh, this album presents as musically sparse as a result. But the symphony it leans heavily on does shine after a while and keeps the effort cohesive. Her voice is still as enchanting as ever, but I think this isn't as lyrically powerful in as many places as the other albums covered. Uh, that doesn't mean the disc is a waste of space, though. I could see spinning it in full once per year, probably around Thanksgiving. Rather unique. Uh, some similar sounding artists that uh, I found Natalie Merchant to be like is Fiona Apple. Jewel, obviously. Dolores O'Riordan from the Cranberries. And Dido, or Ditto, whatever you whatever you prefer. Like <laughs> Shane said, uh, Merchant was a part of 10,000 Maniacs before going solo. She is also an established songwriter, volunteers as a craft teacher in several homeless shelters. And interesting fact, Natalie Merchant and Mark Ruffalo, who is the Hulk, Organized a concert in 2012 to protest against oil and gas fracking in New York. I had no idea that they partnered up and did this concert. So. It doesn't surprise me. I thought it was interesting. I remember being super taken aback by, not in a bad way, but Mark Ruffalo is very publicly political. Mm -hmm. Has been, was, since long before it was, you know popular to, to go out and voice your opinions politically so she definitely seems like quite the humanitarian which definitely. doesn't surprise me even all the way back in 95 yeah she seems like a feminist humanitarian that has a vast emotional connection with art yeah so her artistry feels like it's born of her personality mm -hmm. like music is just something that naturally came out of just like with bjork yeah it's like a love of other things, you know, yeah. people, the human experience, that sort of thing. Her music makes me feel like I'm dreaming of dead loved ones. Uh, if you rush a Natalie Merchant experience, you may not understand the appeal. In time, though, you'll find her backing band has much in common with Counting Crows or Pink Floyd even, and her style is a slightly more hopeful take on the likes of Tori Amos or 
Fiona Apple. Mm. There you go, Raven. Thanks. <laughs> Her music is like an island unto itself, and people who've never visited said island, in my opinion, aren't yet well traveled. Ooh, I thought you were going to say severely lacking in substance. <laughs> no. <laughs> I don't knock people. I want them to come listen to this stuff. I don't. I don't want to be like you're stupid because you don't know this. Okay. <laughs> what is it? Let me. This your musical opinion sucks, and let me tell you why or whatever. The only people who are gonna listen after you say something like that are people who do it out of anger. They're gonna go into it hating it. You know what I mean? Yeah. So just yeah, I, this is good music. <laughs> listen to Natalie Merchant. There's Definitely. something. There's something for everyone here. And if you like any one of the artists that we've mentioned, you'll find something that you like in Natalie Merchant. Break. <laughs> too sudden i mean i felt like i was in high school again <laughs> that's not the best feeling so so our top song list top list i, I still don't know what we're calling this our, our song list you our, don't have to say top you just say song well people need to know list. that this is like it's a list our of choices. songs it's a list of songs uh this week it was top birthday playlist songs um for me do you want me to go first or would yes. you like to go you can okay. go so for my top birthday playlist song, I went with Birthday by the Beatles. Sorry, Shane, not sorry. As far back as I can remember, I have heard this song every celebrated year of my life. Usually sung in the voice of my father. You know, today is your birthday. And he does that stupid clap thing. Anyway, hearing this takes me back to the many parties celebrated at the house in Pilot Point, surrounded by family whether we were hanging out in the gazebo or fighting off the bees that invaded my homemade playhouse that my dad built me very shittily. Sorry, Dad. Or stuffing our faces. We did it as a family, and getting back to more memories like that is high on my priority list. Shittily. I love that word. Shittily. <laughs> and uh, speaking of something I don't love while we're on this topic... Sergeant Pepper. Mm -hmm. Let's talk about it. That that film. I just Don't wanna... hold back. No, I'm not going to... I'm not going to go ham here or anything. I just want to be on the record as saying that's not an experience that I enjoyed. That movie. That's okay. It had, I think star <laughs> power really moves you, huh? It, I mean, it's not, it's not necessarily, the star power is an added benefit, but I mean, there was something kind of, I guess, innocent in the way that it was filmed a little bit. I mean, I know it touches on a lot of serious subject matter, like the corruption of the music industry and things like that. But, you know, star, star Power definitely does help in being able to get, like, Steve Martin and the Bee Gees and Earth, Wind & Fire and Aerosmith all together in one movie is kind of nice. Let us not forget Peter Frampton. Yes, let us not forget old uh, Billy Shears himself. Yeah. Right? I don't even know why they bothered naming these characters. The story is not really... It's in the song. You do reading like it's a 1930s film, mm -hmm. you know? It's and, Billy Shears is the name in in the song Sergeant Pepper. Okay, well, I don't know that I paid that much attention. Well, I can't trust your opinion then. No, you can't. <laughs> you really can't. If I still have high hopes for The Wiz for some reason, still no, haven't seen it. But there's a lot of uh, comparison, you know. How much do you like Diana Ross? I like Diana Ross. We haven't covered her, and I don't know where you. I don't know where you stand on Diana Ross, because some people are like die-hard Diana Ross fans. Who did we cover? We haven't covered Diana Ross, Tina Turner. We covered Tina. We haven't covered Diana Ross. No, did we? No, we didn't. Oh God, we've been doing this too long. We're off in the woods. Let Top me... birthday list. Yeah, birthday playlist songs. Yeah. <laughs> I went with Love Me by Katy Perry. Okay. Uh, my playlist was designed so that each song represents a year of my life. The first 10 songs don't really make sense, you know, because I don't have too many formative memories there that... You got to butt on there, don't you? No. Doing the butt. Break no, I that, don't. Break that. Okay. <laughs> no, I don't. Sorry to disappoint. Dang um, it. I'd love to walk stories for each track, but for now, it's enough to say that this, the 38th song, is there as a representation of my intentions for the next year of my life. I'll be 38 by the time our next episode airs, and lately I've begun realizing that the thing which does the most holding me back is myself. I'm now striving to be more positive, healthy, welcoming, and outgoing. 
From weight loss to romance to writing, I am once again working on being the me I used to love. In the days of trying to repair the way I'm viewed by people who just want me to fit their mold are over. Their loss, not mine, because there's no replacing me. And I hope everyone listening to this lives long enough to believe that about themselves. Man, I'm already liking 38-year-old you. Can't wait. Gonna be good. Yeah, you'll be 38 and I'll be 31. I hate you so much. (laughs) Break. To clarify, I don't actually hate you. Oh, God. Oh, I, I can figure that out, Shane. Thank some, you for the Some people have no uh, no sense of nuance, irony, sarcasm. It's all lost on certain individuals. Mm-hmm. I don't want to associate myself with those individuals. This is going to be heard by an audience of people. I know. Not just by you. So I like to be clear. I thought I was our only listener. <laughs> you might be. <laughs> all right. So moving on to Jewel. The first album that we covered by Jewel was Pieces of You from 1995. This was my top album. Yes, it was my top album as well. Yes. Yes, it was. Uh, I gave it five fives out of 14 tracks. 13. Oh, hot damn. So close. Very close. My top track was Morning Song. Painters. And my bottom track was Daddy. Who will save your soul? Now, what's wrong with Daddy? I don't have... I don't hold resentment towards my father. You've got no negative father So experience. I can't identify okay. like other people that it's, it's got sh- to be like shall remain nameless. Uh, super, super relatable for you. I mean, not necessi- not super relatable. Just... She was kind of, she was going at her father in yeah. that song a little bit. I think some of it's storytelling. She didn't write all of this by herself. It oh. was co-written with another person. It just, I don't know. Out of all the tracks that she did, this one... I think I still gave it a three and I didn't give anything below a three on here. So it just, it wasn't my favorite. Okay. So your bottom track? Who Will Save Your Soul. Oh, okay. Please explain because that was like the top track on this album. I'll get there. Okay. Tell me what you think about the album. The acoustic guitar is nice. Jules' vocals are reminiscent of a sensual female Kermit the Frog, which is something that I need a little bit more of in my life. No disrespect to the artist. Hang on now. (laughs) We... (laughs) <laughs> We're doing one of my sister's top artists here. I didn't say it was still Katie's. my top album. I gave it more fives than I did Natalie Merchant's debut. A sensual Kermit the Frog. You knew. All right. Continuing. <laughs> uh, this is 90s female alternative. Songwriting is very nice. And it's very intimate sounding. Um, by the way, the song I'm Sensitive, I've realized is now my national anthem. So... <laughs> I'm sensitive. Okay. (laughs) Be careful with me because I'm sensitive. Worth noting at the outset here that a few of these tracks on the album, they're different versions from what you know on the radio. This happens a lot on certain discs, Mm -hmm. but what was the big hit? There were a lot of big hits on the CD. I always think of Who Will uh, Save Your Soul. Okay. Yeah. I think you just can't sing like her, and so you get oh, close I could, to Kermit trying to sing like her. but I'm in front of a mic. Like you want me to really try to no, sing in front of a mic? No. Thank you. I'm doing you and everyone else a favor, <laughs> sir. Uh, Tell us what you think about the album. Okay. And quit hanging up on my Kermit the Frog. I, who doesn't love Kermit? That's all I'm going to say. Plainly put, this album has no peer in the realm of acoustic poetry, though it starts out with a song I've never loved and has the common trappings of live-tracked session errors. It's also one of the first albums I was ever obsessed with and remains strong among my favorite recordings. This is the music I want to make and the sort of words I zero in on when I write. Doesn't hurt that Jewel's voice is angelic either. You know, Kermit the Frog there. This disc is a work of emotional art, a masterpiece. You know what? Speaking of a work of emotional art, what is Kermit the Frog's song? I'm drawing blanks today. The, so you, we can Why play. are there so many songs about rainbows? You wouldn't even have to do the uh, uh, ooh, 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 that, ooh, 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 during a music guessing up. game. That is an emotional piece of art, sir. The Rainbow Connection. Rainbow Connection. I mean, Kermit the Frog is not a bad comparison. Yes, it is. No, it's not. It's not a knock. <laughs> Anyway, moving on to the next album by Jewel is 0304. Is that what it's called? Yeah, I would say 0304 for some reason. 0304, 0304 from 2003. It just sounds robotic. 0304. 
0304 from 2003. This was my bottom album. This was actually my middle album. Okay. I gave it two fives out of 14 tracks. 11. My top track is Fragile Heart. Becoming. And my bottom track is a tie between Yes You Can and You and Me Equals Love. Yeah. Stupid ass song title. Yeah. Some of these song titles are are bad and they they have the like the word two is written as the number two Mm -hmm. and the word you is just the letter u it's that sort of thing it's that time period yeah i was gonna say which was popular for the time period my bottom track was haunted okay but speaking of the time period this sounds more like madonna's electronic contributions uh more specifically the song beautiful stranger um This adds in a little bit more electronic, early 2000s sounds of the time, while at times staying true to her 90s folk pop roots. Uh, This can be cheesy and dancey. And for me, it's reaching a little bit just to seem relevant for the music at the time. Okay, you'll notice some common words here. Got it. Bright, cheesy dance pop Mm -hmm. is not what I want from a Jewel listening experience, but this goofy, samey, and oddly shallow spin does manage being competently listenable. Most tracks have just enough movement in the melody and punch in the hooks to keep it from being stale. I hate how little this disc has in common with her debut, but it's still a solid pop effort. Moving on to Sweet and Wild from 2010. This was my middle album. Bottom. I gave it two fives out of 11 tracks. Nine. And my top track was What You Are and Stay Here Forever. Are those two different songs? Probably. I might have I didn't said write that they're a tie. Writing, but... Well, thanks. Yeah, it's been a while since I did these listens, so it's it's a little lost on me right now. But my top track was Bad As It Gets. And my bottom track was No Good and Goodbye. Fading. She's switching it up for this one, guys. This is fast-paced country music. A complete roller coaster artist that Jewel is. She starts off with folk pop with the first album that we covered, then gets into electronic dance music with 0304. And now with Sweet and Wild, she's bringing us full fledged into the country genre. Vocals fit the genre a little bit better here. So my Kermit the Frog knock fits really, really well with Sweet and Wild as well. Uh, still seems a little bit safe and middle of the road for me. This is why it did not get my top rating like Pieces of You did. I think if you were to listen to each of her albums from start to finish, it's not as... Like, I cut these on purpose so mm-hmm. you get the different yeah, genres. I figured. But you... What am I trying to say? It's not like Nelly Furtado where you go from... Where it's what this looks like, you know? Mm-hmm. You've got a folk album. You've got a pop album. Yeah. You know, then you've got... Your Spanish album, that sort of like it's not that situation. She does actually slowly move into these other genres. Yeah, it doesn't seem like as a gradual jump. Mm-hmm. Okay, but I have to say though, this one's going to be a tough sell for most people. It's still hokey pop, but now with lots of country influence. Uh, to make matters worse, much of the production feels as plastic as something like an Ashley Simpson or a Lindsay Lohan album. And personally, I don't dig Jewel's voice in the country medium. But in spite of all that, there are some definite strengths here. Most hooks and melodies land, and there's more depth than initially meets the ear. I can't see myself revisiting this for fun and think certain fives are weak, but pop country fans won't be disappointed for the most part. Speaking of pop country fans, some similar sounding artists, Dolores O'Riordan from the Cranberries, Alanis Morissette, Madonna, and Taylor Swift. You forgot the Muppets. Yeah, the Muppets. You're right. How could I forget them? The song makes me feel like I'm in a coffee house on a rainy fall evening or later album, like I'm at a Southern songwriting competition. All right. Well, now you can come at me if you want. Uh, The music makes me feel like I'm hearing Baby Spice having an identity crisis. Okay. I mean that in great ways. If you know Spice Girls fanaticism over here, yeah. I don't hate that. No. Um, For those of you that don't know, Jewel was raised in Alaska. The Pieces of You debut album was certified 11 times platinum. She changed direction and started making country music in about 2009. And she is a founding member of the humanitarian group Higher Ground for Humanity and is a very, very celebrated songwriter. She's also published some poetry Mm -hmm. and her family has a TV show I do not remember what it's called. It's one of those Alaskan shows. They're not the only family in it. Okay. But it's one of those that follows these families that exist in the remote wilds of Alaska, you know? Oh, So if you want to see her brother and her dad, you just 
living their lives and stuff. You can totally watch that. Huh. I think it's still on Netflix. Huh. To be most successful in the future, I've realized, by the way, that most successful in the future means what I want to hear from you, uh -huh. not how you should actually be successful, mm -hmm. but uh, stick to lyrically powerful acoustic folk sounds. That is, that's her strength. I will, I will give you that. That Pieces of You album, even though I made the comparison to Kermit the Frog because she does do this yodel thing, and that's all it is, damn good album. I realized something when I was listening to these two artists. I, I went with Jewel second, and I took each of these like a day at a time. Mm -hmm. But after listening to Pieces of You, I realized that like there's not anything that my music that's on Spotify you can really play alongside or mix and match with. It just doesn't sound great, mm -hmm. and it's... Like even some of the early dashboard is shinier and yeah, and her voice is way, way better than mine. Uh, but like the sound on pieces of you reminds me of again the way that I record stuff. So it just feels natural to me. It's it's ingrained. It's baked into me. Yeah, and I think it's so much listening to this. We talked about on that live thing we did the music you'd want to hear when it's raining outside or yeah. you're watching outside of a rainy window mm -hmm. and I said the pieces of you album by Jewel yes that's because I mean I, I did it plenty did you forget what I said how the music makes me feel like I'm in a coffee house on a rainy fall evening so there, there you, you go. go there you go just <laughs> <laughs> just wear shirts from now there, there you, you go, go. Uh, Jules certainly had a strong showing for me, if judged by the baseline of my fives, and she has a surprising amount of consistency, considering all the genre shifting we heard her do here. But she's also gone from making some of the most insightful music to making the sort that drives many people to hate popular music. So I completely get why this artist wouldn't be for everyone myself. I'm torn between a lot of competing feelings, which made her difficult to recommend in full. So just make sure you've experienced her debut album. It's a game changer. All right, so do I even need to ask who won for you? Uh, yeah, you do. It was it was actually Jewel, but mine, I, I love both of these artists. Just to clarify, go ahead. Mine was Jewel as well, but it was extremely close. Jewel with at a 3.48 and Natalie with a 3.42. So Still averaging, huh? We've what established you... we're, we're different in our rating <laughs> no, system. We are. You do anything you want to do. It's I fine. will. Again, all this bracket stuff, it's kind of for show anyway. I hate brackets. That's what's funny about the fact that we do this. I absolutely hate brackets because if you take two strong competitors, mm -hmm. which is what happens here, because I tend to like the sound of both artists that we're covering on one episode. Yeah. One of those two gets knocked out. So you'll see one of my favorite artists go where they should be competing right at the end. It's, it's a hard feeling when the Battle of the Bands rolls around and we have to list all of them. There's that game on the Jackbox. It's the t-shirt game where you make yeah. t-shirts and then it brackets it. Uh -huh. Always hated that. Why? It's like, Just because... It hurts your feelings so easily. Like, my shirt was so badass <laughs> and here we are voting on this dumb t-shirt in the end. So, before we go, mm -hmm. I have to let you guys know, and gals, guys, gals, in-betweens, ghouls, ghouls days, it's fall. whatever it is, want to let you know what we're in for next time. So, a month from now, we'll be back with... Typo negative versus the misfits. Just in time for spooky season. Yeah, and we drew the misfits because our friend Mina put it in the jar as one of her top 10 artists of all time. Uh, typo negative albums were covering Bloody Kisses from 93, October Rust from 96, World Coming Down from 99. Misfits, I went with Walk Among Us from 82, American Psycho from 97, and Famous Monsters from 99. There's a lot I could say here, but I'm not going to. No, Please save judge it for me next, in a month. <laughs> save it for next episode, man. All right. That's all I got to say about that. Well, that's going to do it for this week. Hit up our playlist on Spotify. Visit our merch shop. Share our show with your friends. Come find us on social media to let us know what you think. And until next time, fill your world with music. And know that someday you'll find it. The Rainbow Connection. Rainbow Connection.